So yeah, this is gonna be the the any percent tutorial for ATC. It's pretty much just gonna be like a guide for beating all the levels and also doing a few strats, like speedrun strats. And uh yeah, so I think oh I think the way I wanna do this is um, not actually starting the timer yet because um, beforehand I want to actually show off the uh, I want to show off the crouch jumping tech SpongeBob! that is uh, fairly important. But normally here you would skip this set of tutorials or the, the set of Xboxes, but I'm actually gonna go into the tutorial here, and the reason for that is so uh, I can quickly show off uh, the crouch jumping tech because it will be kind of useful at varying points in the run. So you can see here, like normally you can't make this jump, like no matter how hard you try. But if you crouch at the peak of your jump, it actually makes like your hitbox shorter and it lets you make this jump like that. That's why I'm like using the input display because it makes it a little bit easier to demonstrate. But yeah, like normally if you don't crouch, you can't make this jump. But if you crouch, then you can make it. So that's for making jumps that are barely too tall. And then you can also use the crouch jump tech to make farther jumps than normal. So I think like normally you can jump to that platform, but it's kind of hard. But if you crouch right before you land, it does like the same thing basically where it makes your hitbox shorter. So you're able to make jump like farther jumps than you can normally so i think like even without crouching yeah you can still make this jump without crouching but um it's like useful to know that you can make like slightly longer jumps uh by crouching like right before you land so like the main thing that you want to know is you can crouch jump to make uh higher jumps than normal, and you can also do it to make farther jumps than normal. So then, with that explanation, um, I'm gonna actually start the, the run, like, proper. So, um, normally when you're starting a run, um, there's actually, if you don't have a, a save file already created, then the timing would start as soon as you hit new game. But if you do have a save file already created, then, um, you would, uh, start it uh, when you hit yes on this prompt. So yeah, depending on if you have save data or not prior, then that like would uh, affect the time or the the input when you would start the timer. So here you would start it right when you click on yes. Ah, and I'm using uh, blank splits for this. So here you want to immediately press space to skip this cutscene. And you want to have your mouse like in this area so that you can immediately skip these text boxes and then press space again to skip that one. And then you want to uh, click on that prompt to just continue right away. And then basically this is like where the run actually starts. So you don't need to do anything here for a bit, you just... Um, you just want to click on this text box here. 
a lot a, a bit of this is just knowing like when to press space to skip cutscenes and when to have your mouse in that spot to skip text boxes. Then the first strat that we're gonna do here with the crouch jumping tech that I showed earlier is that you're gonna jump on this box and then you're gonna jump over here. So I can kinda like show that again. But yeah, that's why I'm using an input display. So sometimes the pinkies can be like in your way like this. And sometimes you are like forced to get zapped by them. But yeah, basically, like I showed earlier, you want to um, use the, the first crouch jump to make a higher jump than normal. Then you want to crouch in the middle of that jump to make a farther jump. Um, so I'm just gonna restart the level because I think I can't make it to the end in time anymore after that explanation, but yeah. So that's how that first strat is, and then from there, um, from there you basically take like this little route like along the fence like the bamboo fence, and that allows you to just go like straight to the end of the section. So me like quitting out of the level there, that wasn't actually necessary. It's just that I needed to restart the level because um, if you take too long then you die and have to restart the section anyways. So normally you don't have to quit out of the level there, but yeah. You do the crouch jump on here, you jump over here. And uh, crouching in midair for that jump makes it a bit easier. It, it makes it like a bit less precise. So then you want to go around here. You don't have to jump. Uh, you can actually just like avoid jumping if you want to be a bit more cautious, but it is faster to jump. And then you want to fall around this section when, when you see the funnel of glove over there and then basically there's like a trigger like right here that ends this section of the level so then another thing that should be mentioned is that you saw like in the middle of that uh like transition between areas that it was like a black screen you can actually buffer inputs like during that transition so that does like help in some instances where like you can see me like immediately moving as soon as an area loads because you can buffer the input so when you get here you want to there's basically like a trigger like right here in the middle of the shelf you want to hit the trigger and then turn back. That's like the most optimal way to progress the next session. Then you want to press space on this cutscene. Again, like I mentioned before, a part of the run is knowing like where every single skippable cutscene is. And then from here, um, you, you're basically like in a maze at this point. And your goal is to find where Spongebob is, and Spongebob can spawn in any of the four corners of the map as indicated by the little circles on the map. So, um, ideally in a speedrun you want Spongebob to spawn in the top right corner, but it's obviously a 25% chance if he spawns there. Additionally, um, there's also like the patty and the conch. The patty is useful in that it it like keeps the gloveys occupied for a bit because you do have to deal with enemies in this maze, which is the gloveys mainly. And each room basically has like its own gimmick, as you can see here. But most of the gimmicks are like fairly self-explanatory. So now I'm just gonna like actually go into the maze 
And the way that you stop the Glovies is by um, shining your light at them. Because one of them just like kind of follows you around and you just look at it to stop it. And then the other one, um, it runs at you and you stop it by shining your light at it and then it will disappear. And then it will respawn in one of the corners. So... Yeah, like that. And then, okay, so yeah, so Spongebob didn't spawn here. And then there's the other Glovey. Uh, Spongebob only spawns specifically, like, on the edge of each corner. So even though there's nine rooms in each corner, he only spawns in five of the nine rooms. Making it like a 5% a chance that he spawns in a specific room. So you can see the patty here. But like I mentioned before, the patty will stun... It will, it will keep like the Glovies occupied for a while. So you can use that time to... Um, to continue looking for Spongebob. So yeah, there is like a little bit of luck involved. Like if you're trying to be optimal for this level. So yeah, here you can see the conch tells you exactly where Spongebob is. It gives you a, like a description of the room. So now we know that he's in the bottom right. Because it's a um, orange glovey blue room. So then, like, for those clam rooms, you basically can't sprint through that room or you die. The gas rooms, uh, they don't kill you, but they make, like, this phantom glovey appear that, that doesn't actually kill you, but it just, like, makes you unable to see for a bit. It's mainly just making sure you don't get the phantom glovey and the actual glovey confused. Because the, the real glovey can actually kill you. Okay, yeah. So I did go a little bit farther than I needed to, but yeah, basically, Punjab is right here. And then that's like the entire level, basically. So, like, ideally, like I said before, you would want Spongebob to spawn in the top right, but it is luck-based to which part he spawns in. Then you want to skip that text box, and then there's going to be another text box afterwards. And then, um... You can, you can click on this continue button even before it's like visible, like the hitbox for it is here even when it's not like actually there yet. So then you, uh, some people split like as soon as they hit the continue button, but for me I split on the fade out of the results screen. So I would split there, but there's like different places that you can split. Some people split on load, other people split on on clicking the continue button, and then I, I split on fade out. So then after you beat that level, you want to make sure that you hit this to disable hints. And then basically what that does is that every time you enter a level, you don't have to wait like for an extra like eight seconds for uh, potty to like give you a hint so you see here like we're able to load into this level like much quicker than glove world All right. because we don't have to worry about the hints so then you want to skip you want to hit skip on that and then press space bar to skip this cutscene and the reason we do or the reason why I do Squidward's monument after like right after glove world is just because, um, like, the, the segment is very variable in terms of time loss compared to other segments. So basically here you have to get four uh, art pieces and then leave. So the Bold and Brash painting can spawn here. 
it can spawn up here, which it did, and it can also spawn in a closet over here. They can spawn in here too. So each item besides the last one has three different spots that they can spawn. And then you also have to deal with Big Lenny. The way Big Lenny works is that he basically just patrols random rooms until he sees you and then when he sees you he like charges up a, a little electricity bolt to shoot at you. You can actually jump over the bolt that he shoots at you but um, it's a little bit tricky to time so it's a lot easier to just avoid it. And then also how the AI works is that you saw like he stopped chasing me after I got out of his line of sight for a little bit. That's basically how all the AIs work. Where they'll basically de-aggro once you get out of their line of sight for like a few seconds. So then you'll see like Big Lenny just stop chasing me and turned around. So yeah, you can do that to like de-aggro any enemy basically. Then the, the Squillium painting can spawn here at the top of the stairs. It can spawn here, and it can also spawn in this hallway where Big Lenny's at right now. And it's just random where it spawns, so that's why it's a bit like variable. Like how long this segment takes. So you can't, the, the thing with this piece is that you can't sprint while you're holding. So um, you have to be careful when you're trying to get to the front door with this piece and with the wax sculpture, but with the other two you can sprint while carrying them. The good thing is that Big Lenny like moves at the same speed as you. Uh, is, he moves at the same speed as your walking speed, so you can actually just outwalk him, basically. If you're carrying uh, one of the heavy objects. Uh, oh yeah, so I forgot to mention. So the clarinet can spawn in here. It can spawn in the closet in the bedroom. It can spawn there. And it can also spawn on the top floor as well, like right next to where the, um, right next to where the bold and brash painting can spawn. And then the wax sculpture is always in the same spot every time, but you, uh, the power goes out in the house after the third piece, so you're forced to take the stairs to get up. Because on every other piece you can take either the elevator or the stairs, but on this one you have to take the stairs to get up. And then, like with the Squillium painting, you can't sprint while carrying this. So you just have to be careful that uh, like you don't run into Big Lenny. So Big Lenny went downstairs, so we actually have to wait for him to come back up. If you're following like right behind him, you can actually sneak out the front door before he can actually get to you, but since I was a little bit behind him when he went down, it's a bit safer to just wait. So yeah, then that's Monument. You can immediately skip this cutscene by pressing space and then click on the spot where the continue button would be after the little animation it does, and then that's when this segment ends. So then afterwards in the route, um, I go to Patrick's Rock. So you can do any of these four levels in whatever order you want. But this is the order that is most convenient to me. But for, for the house levels and some other levels in the game, you can actually do them out of order. All right. Like, if you want to. So you just want to skip this. And then uh, for this section, you just need to 
like pick up the toys that are in these boxes so you can just move over here spam e on that one you don't actually have to be like looking at something to interact with it you can actually be like facing the opposite direction and still be able to interact with something so that is like useful to note And then you just want to skip this. And then at the very start of this section, you can actually just press F to turn on your flashlight like immediately before you actually gain control. This is like a tiny thing, it doesn't really make a difference. And then here is the sand maze section. So basically. There's like a few different ways that you can go here. So some people like go this way. Um, but um, there is a chance that Prowler Pat will be in my way. Okay, so he's that way. So the way that Prowler Pat works is that he always knows where you are. So it, you can't like de-aggro him like you can with... Uh, other enemies so he always knows where you are and whenever he's in your line of sight or whenever you're in his line of sight then he does like this little static distortion effect on your screen and if the distortion effect is on your screen for too long then you die so um yeah it doesn't really matter too much because you can kind of like run through this section pretty quickly and usually you don't even see prowler pat uh, so i think i'm actually yeah i'm gonna die on purpose so that i can show like the proper route that you're supposed to take here so basically the route that i take for the sand maze is um going right at the very start and then going this way and you want to take a left here. And then if Prowler Pat is there, then you actually want to run to the other exit because basically this maze has two exits. And um, depending on where Prowler Pat spawns, it can be beneficial to go to the exit on the left or the one on the right. So this way is the exit on the right. So you just go down there and then it transitions to the next area, but now I'm gonna go the uh, the exit on the left. So you can also take this way. Like the reason taking this way is good is because it's this is pretty much like the intersection between the left exit and the right exit. Okay, so he's there. So if he spawns there, you, I think it's still faster to go to the left exit. You just have to kind of go to this little railway section. But normally you can just cut through and end up here. And then you can just um, go through this exit. And then there's also like a, a third way that you can go through the sand maze that I'm going to show. This route is not as good as the other one though because um, there, are, there are two uh, Prowler Pat spawns where he can be in your way. Because he can spawn here and he can also spawn like in this railway section so that time he spawned over there which is good. But the other route is a bit better because it pretty much takes the same amount of time to get to this exit and there's less of a chance that a uh, prowler pat is in your way so then uh once you get to the exit you can just go through and transition to the next section oh, yeah. and then the the gimmick with this section is that you need to get to the end with these little like shadow boys popping out of nowhere and you just get rid of them by pointing your light at them and if they touch you you die so you just have to be careful like 
not to let them get too close to you. So for this section, like, it's recommended that you use headphones because it makes it a lot easier to tell what direction they're coming from. But yeah. And then after you get here, you grab the toys and then you just run back in exactly the same path that you took to get here. But now you have, uh... You have Prowler Pat chasing you through this section, so now you're forced to be constantly on the move. You can see him like way back there. So you can't dilly-dally too much on your way back, because then Prowler Pat will kill you because he isn't affected by the flashlight. Then once you get to the end, then this is like basically the last section of the level. Which is basically like an escape sequence. But here the main threat is enemies called the Prowlers. Basically is these dudes which are like semi-transparent. So it's a bit hard to be able to see them. Like uh, since you need to be like using your flashlight to be able to see them. So then for this section, there's basically like a little strat called fast cannons where um, you can actually, there's like a set of boxes that you don't actually need to jump for, you can just like run across them without falling. So basically, I think I'll die on purpose here just to show what the cycle looks like, like if you don't stop at any point. But yeah, the main thing is just watching out for the prowlers because uh, sometimes it can be kind of hard to see unless they're like right in front of your face. But they are quite slow so you can like navigate around them if they're in front of you. So then here you can just do a set of quick jumps. You don't need to jump for this one and then you jump for all the other ones and then that's basically the fast cycle for that. So yeah, then this is another section where you have to deal with Prowlers. But yeah, like I mentioned before, they're pretty slow so you can navigate around them fairly easily. And then this is the end of the section, you just go into this beam of light. Then you skip another cutscene with spacebar. Then you want to you kind of want to move your mouse to like the bottom left corner so that you can immediately click on the skip tutorial button. Then after that you use space to skip another cutscene, you use space to skip another cutscene, and then that's the end of the level. Also yeah, hello Shadow, um, haven't, uh, I haven't been responding to chat too much because I'm trying to make sure I don't forget anything with the tutorial, so sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, next is Anchor Way. The, the whole objective of this level is basically... Um, basically that you need to collect $18 and get out in one piece. But uh, Pearl is going to be like patrolling the the house. So you want to um, go up here and then the level starts like as soon as you interact with this first stack of cash. And then basically there's a lot of places that the money can spawn. So one can spawn around here. One can spawn here, which it already is. And one can spawn on this couch. On top of that, one can spawn on this chair as well. In each room, there are four different places that money can spawn, but it's not going to spawn in every spot. So there's one there, one can spawn here, one can spawn here, 
and one can spawn on this little chest here. Then in this room, one can spawn here, 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 and here. So you, you kind of need to know like all the possible places that the money can spawn. But right now, I'm just like showing all of the places that they can spawn. So one can spawn here, 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 or here in this room. Yeah, like I mentioned before, is four spots in every room. So here is for this room, and then here, and then on these two chairs, the money can also spawn. And then for the bedroom area, um, the money can spawn in on this shelf, like it's two spots next to each other. And then it can spawn here and it can also spawn on the bed itself. And then in the bathroom, the money can spawn in this corner and spawn here on the sink or on the toilet. And then um, after that, the last spot is the the last place you need to go to is the basement. The so money can spawn like behind these two barrels, and it can also spawn on these two shelves. So I'm gonna die on purpose so that I can like show how the level is supposed to look. Or how the, the segment is supposed to look, rather. So I just restart the entire level. So then, uh, the other thing is how Pearl works. So basically, the way that Pearl works is that throughout the level, she's basically just sleepwalking all over the place. Uh, like, to different rooms. And she can't see you while she's sleepwalking, obviously. But uh, there are some points where Pearl will actually wake up and do like a little head swipe like looking back and forth but she does it from a stationary position so she doesn't move while she's doing that little head swipe animation so you can kind of like use that to your advantage so then this is pretty much like the route that i normally take for getting all the money as quick as possible So on the way up here, I'd like to see where Pearl is going to have a general idea of like where she is as I'm like running around getting all the money. And then mainly you just want Pearl to not wake up like at an inopportune time, like when you need to when she's in a room where you, that you need to go to. So yeah, uh, the the main thing is that when you enter the basement, you want to make sure that you have um, sixteen dollars because there's only there's always only two in the basement. So make sure you have sixteen when you go in here, and then the last two will always be in those spots that I mentioned. Then after that, you grab the gun and then you just go back to the start, basically. And then you have to shoot down Pearl. So that's uh, pretty easy. You just like hold down the left mouse and then it just like obliterates her, basically. And then that's anchor way. So yeah, the, the main thing is that if you see that Pearl's uh, icon on the bottom left is yellow, then you want to get out of her line of sight as quick as you can because then when it goes to red, she's going to do like her head swipe thing. And then that's when she's able to see you if she is, if you're in her line of sight. So that's just the main thing you want to be concerned about there. And then the after that is pineapple.
So pineapple is when the the doodle gang gets into the equation. They're pretty much like a right. recurring antagonist throughout the story of the game. So you want to skip that text box, then immediately press space to skip cutscene. And then you just want to start running forward and interact with this. So before I do that, um, like if you look at the ceiling, you can see that there are like different spots where there's like little pencil shavings on the ceiling. And the reason for that is that those are places that the doodle Patrick can spawn on the ceiling. Because basically the way that doodle pat works is that he just spawns in different spots of the ceiling and if you stand under him when he's there then you die instantly then the way doodle bob works is that he kind of follows like this patrol route he follows a very consistent patrol route and then like if he sees you um he'll just start chasing you so now I'm just going to show like how the segment is supposed to look. And then also I forgot to mention that with the, the little squid doodle that he like draws after he enters the living room. If you step on that uh, squid doodle, then uh, doodle Bob will like instantly teleport to him and like redraw him. So you can use that to like instantly de-aggro uh, Doodle Bob if he's chasing you. Or just like manipulate him to go to a specific part of the house like immediately. So there are actually like two different routes that you can take here. So I'm going to show what one of them looks like. This is like the safer route. So the safer route here is just like waiting for Doodle Bob to pass by, but there is another route where you can actually like immediately aggro him at the start and then like jump over him to de-aggro him. So then, de so like I mentioned before, the little pencil shaving marks like on the ceiling are the different spots that doodle pack can be however even if he's like in your way you can actually like shimmy past him in each room so there's like uh there's like different ways that you can shimmy past doodle patrick in each room that he can spawn in so I think I could probably demonstrate that. So when he's there, you can kind of shimmy past them like that. And he won't kill you. When he's in the kitchen, you can kind of just like hug the wall. And um, he won't kill you. And then for the top of the stairs, you can kind of just hug the wall like this and he won't kill you. And then for here, you hug the wall and he won't kill you. And then for this one, you also hug the wall and he won't kill you. So it's mainly just hugging the wall. So since I took the time to demonstrate that, I'm going to have to do all of that again. But um, yeah, so now I'll actually show what the two routes look like properly. So first I'm going to show the, the route that is like safer and works like pretty consistently. And then I'll show the route that is a little bit more inconsistent but it is faster by a few seconds. So I pretty much like always avoid uh, each of Doodle Pat's spawns unless I know exactly where he is. 
So then once you get here, you want to step on the squid doodle to immediately de-aggro uh, doodle bob. And then for some reason doing that cuts out the music, so uh, it's kind of just like awkward silence for like 30 seconds after you do that. But then the music comes back as soon as um, doodle bob chases you at the end. So then there you want to step on the squid doodle again because we can take advantage of the fact that um, doodle bob instantly teleports to the squid doodle if you step on it. So then after that you want to get there, you want to pick up Gary and then just run to the exit. And then you just want to interact with that door but I'm going to die on purpose to uh, show the other route. Yep. So yeah, like, it's not too bad once you know, like, exactly how the level works. So with this route, you want to just enter this room right away. Then you want to crouch him onto that barrel and then, like, jump over Doodle Bob. And then basically, since you jump over him, uh, you kind of go out of, like, his line of sight radius, so... He's not able to, like, see you, technically. So, um... He kind of, like, de basically, even though he should theoretically just turn around and continue chasing you. So I think that time I did kind of mess up this route a little bit, but I think it actually worked out. Normally... Uh, you want to step on the squid doodle, like, when it's kind of, like, heading into the the hallway in front of the gym. But that time I stepped on it in the living room, but it didn't really matter too much. And then after you do all that, you just run out the door. So yeah, you kind of have to, like, adapt a little bit based on, like, where doodle pat is but the important thing is is that you can shimmy past them in any of the spots that he spawns in so you don't have to like wait for him to pass by so yeah that's pineapple and then after you do the four house levels in whatever order you want then the next set of levels unlocks so, you can also do, do those two levels in whatever order you want, but typically I like to do Tentacle Acres first. Okay. So then right at the start you want to skip that text box, and then basically what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to like go around this dumpster and basically interact with this to push it to that other side. But you can actually interact with it from this side. If you stand like here, you can actually interact with the dumpster without having to go all the way around like this. So you just interact with it. Then uh, you can jump onto the side of it like this. But it's a little bit faster to crouch jump onto it instead since you can get on top of it in only one jump. And then here, it's important that you try to jump as far as you can. Because there's basically like a cutscene trigger here. That is supposed to show like an introduction for two of the enemies that are prevalent here. But since you can jump over that cutscene trigger, that basically like... It like locks Patrick outside, so you can probably see that he's still like out there somewhere. And these lasers only activate when Patrick goes through them, and not when you go through them. So you can just pass through them like that. 
So that basically like uh, lets you cheese this entire section since you can just run through all the lasers. But normally you have to go like between all of these lasers and do like little side paths. But if you do that strat, you can literally just run all the way to the end without any interference. The only thing you need to be wary of is that at the end of this section, there is uh, an enemy that you have to be careful with. There's basically an enemy that burrows underground. And um, it can be kind of like hard to see if you don't already know that it's there. So right now, I'm not really sure where it is. But sometimes it can be like around here and you need to like navigate around it. And you just need to get to this door without that um, enemy killing you. So then uh, once you get in here, uh, Patrick will berate you for doing a speedrun skip that locks him outside. And then uh, you want to interact with this um, television and then skip this dialogue. So then here, um, there's like specific cycles that you want to go on to like escort Patrick to the other side. So that For that first one, you want to wait like one second before uh, progressing. For this one, you want to wait like two seconds before uh, pressing the up arrow. Then for this one, you want to wait for the guard to like pass this pole here. Like this lamp pole. Then you want to go. And then as soon as you are able to move again, you want to immediately go to the right. That basically skips having to wait for that guard to pass by. Since you can kind of just book it like immediately before you can even see you. So then once you get to this section, you get a checkpoint. So if you die, you don't have to like redo that entire first section again. And then here, uh, anytime that you have the ability to hide in a bush, you just want to hide in the bush like immediately. And then wait for the guards to be like facing the right way so that you can pass by. Then for this one, you want to wait like about three seconds or so before you go so that uh, the guard turns like right before you're inside of his uh, flashlight radius. Then this guard can either go to the left or to the right, so you need to like react to what direction he's going in. It's not always the same every time, so you have to be a bit careful of that. And then you have to wait for around there to slip past the spotlight here. And then once you're at the end, you just hit the, X, uh, the question mark button and then skip this text. And that basically is the entire uh, escort section. And then basically there's like this little escape sequence, you just kind of run through this entire section. And it's basically like that entire uh, like walk that we had to do to get all the way here, now we have to do that entire walk all the way back. But now there's gonna be like some cards that pop out of these little Wide areas that will start chasing us. But you can sort of just like run past them without any issues. So then you just want to run all the way to this gate, and then that'll cause the next section to occur. Oh, 
You want to skip this text box, and then basically is like a little boss fight that you have to do. Now this boss fight is pretty much like scripted. There's like an auto scroller. Basically, you can't do anything to progress. So basically, you just dodge his attacks, and then uh, Patrick will give you a, a ton of mayo that you can use to throw at him. And I basically aim like a little bit above that cloud in the skybox. That's pretty much like the best uh, trajectory to aim in so that it hits some like square in the face. And his attacks are exactly the same every single time, so like once you once you study like exactly how his attack patterns are, then it's 100 percent consistent every time. So then after that you want to skip another cutscene. And that time I kind of showed off that you can uh you can click the continue button without actually, um, or without the continue button actually being there yet because of like the little animation. So then next is Bargain Mart. This is like a much more like chill segment compared to the previous segments. <laughs> You're kind of just like vibing, like going down these aisles, picking up all these tubs of mayo. So currently, like this is the route that seems to be like the quickest. So basically just like follow what I do here. And uh, this is like the route that I use in actual runs. So while you're uh, picking up all these tubs of mayo, you just have to be wary of all of these like AIs that are walking around. Because if you bump into them, then your little like exposure meter in the bottom left will fill up a little bit. And basically if you get hit by three of the AIs, then your exposure meter will go all the way up and all of the AIs will start chasing after you. So here you kind of want to like hug the wall so that you can avoid getting hit by that um, like employee there that's kind of like waiting there. If you don't hug the wall then, you, then he'll actually hit you. But again like it doesn't matter too much because you can get a uh, you can run into an AI two times without anything happening. It's only on the third time where it's actually problematic. The only exception to that is uh, the little kid that occasionally runs around. If you bump into the kid, then it will immediately make your exposure meter go all the way up. So you want to avoid bumping into the kid at all costs, basically. But if you bump into anyone else, it will only fill up the exposure meter like a little bit. And then yeah, you want to like pick up those Krabby Patties because they give you a pretty nice speed boost. So this route kind of like picks up the patties as often as possible. So yeah, it's like, this level is uh, fairly self-explanatory for like most of it. It's mainly just like dodging the AIs and making sure that you don't run into the kid. Then once you get to this point, you'll either be at at a 94 or 95 because I picked up an extra one like earlier. Um, but basically there's like one last uh, little line of mayo that we need to get 
in this corner. And then after you get this line of mayo, you want to like run to the front door and try to interact with the door like as soon as you can. And then if you do that properly, then you're you'll basically like die and progress to the next section like at the same time. And whenever something like that happens, the game will always prioritize you advancing to the next section. So there are like a lot of areas in the game where you can like die and progress uh, to the next section at the same time. And it will always prioritize you advancing to the next section. So you basically like take advantage of that there. Because you saw that we did like die to one of the officers there, but since we interacted with the door first, it took priority over the death. So we were still able to beat the level regardless. So then next is boating school. You just want to skip this text box and then press space on the load here to immediately skip a cutscene. Uh, so there are three boatmobiles that each have, or each can have a key inside of them, and you need the key to be able to progress in the level. Oh, so in, in this case, it's spawn here, but I'll also show where the other two boatmobiles are. And just like everything else, it's random uh, where the key spawns. You can actually hide behind this wall. There is like a spotlight that is uh, going around. I don't know how it saw me there, but yeah. There is like a spotlight that is like going around the level and you actually need to avoid being in the spotlight or else you'll die if you are inside of it for too long so you just need to be wary of that you want to press space to immediately skip a cutscene and then i sort of like hold up right and spam e to immediately place the whoopee cushion here and then you have to like wait for like 10 seconds here or something before you can oh, no. open this door and then that's basically when the section starts so you want to run to this room as fast as you can because Puff starts in this room, but you can kind of like hide uh, behind that like uh, behind that table with kelp on it. You can like hide behind it so you can run all the way over there, get the janitor's key and then catch right back up to Puff. I do what I can. So then you need to rescue three of these captives without Puff killing you, and you have to do all of them in one life. So it's pretty, like, imperative that you don't die in this section. So then here you can hear that uh, Puff is doing, like, her sniffy thing. And basically whenever she does that, she's able to see you from any direction. So that prevents you from just, like, being right behind Puff like the entire level. And you can hear her, um, Keep your grimy hands you can hear her like moving around and opening doors, so you can kind of use that to know where she is. And there's also like certain places that you can stand to stay out of her line of sight. Like there you can stand right next to that door and she won't see you. So there are like different places like that where you can stand and Puff like won't see you. So you can uh, use that to your advantage. You can also hide here and this spot is like completely safe because even if Puff is chasing you and you go into the section, it will actually like confuse her AI and make you think that you're in the other room. 
So even if she's chasing you, you can de-aggro her by going into that little corner there. And it will make her think that you're in the other room next door. I'll let you pass your driver's test if you show yourself. You so that spot is like completely safe. So you mainly just like want to be cautious and make sure that Puff like doesn't see you. Most of the times like if Puff sees you, uh, you're dead basically like that. <laughs> nice timing. <laughs> yeah, the reason she saw me there is because um, she did her sniffy thing. And like I mentioned before, she does her sniffy thing, she's able to see you from any direction, so that prevents you from just uh, standing right behind her the entire time. But I wasn't expecting her to do the sniffy thing at that exact second that I was like behind her. But she only does it like periodically, like every 30 seconds or so. So there are some moments where you can just follow directly behind her and be fine. If you know that she did her sniffy thing like not too long ago. So this is another spot that you can stand and even if she goes here she'll just walk right past you. I think she went down the long hallway, but I'm just gonna wait for her to come back. Yeah, I'm just hoping that she doesn't do her sniffy thing again. I think she might do it at a bad time okay so she just did it right as she entered that door but luckily we're just like barely out of her line of sight so she didn't see us there even though she did her sniffy thing that's right Yeah, there's like a lot of places that uh, you can hide from Puff. I already showed earlier that you can you can hide behind this little kelp uh, table thing. You won't be able to see you if you're hiding behind this. And then uh, you can also hide here if she's passing by from this side. You can hide here if she's passing through by it from this side, or you can hide here if she's passing through from that side. So it's basically just like making sure you're out of her line of sight. You can hide behind this right here. I already showed earlier that you can hide next to that barrel over there if she's coming from that door in the distance. If you're hiding behind this crate though, you need to crouch because otherwise she'll see you. If she uh, uh, looks in your direction. Okay. So yeah, those are like the different places that you can uh, hide from Puff basically. So yeah, you can kind of use like the volume of her footsteps to know like where she is roughly. And then after you get the third captive, you can just run to the exit. You, uh, you can actually have Puff chasing you while you're taking the third captive out. Because much like uh, earlier in Bargain Mart, even if she kills you like after you interact with the door, you uh, interacting with the door will take priority and you'll still like beat the level even if she catches you like a millisecond afterwards. So yeah, you can just like 
Like, use that to your advantage, basically. Like, specifically when you have the third captive, you kind of can just, like, book it to the exit. Even if, uh, off is chasing you, because most likely you'll be able to just make it to the exit before she can actually kill you. So then at the start of the level here, you want to press space to skip a cutscene. This is uh, one of two levels in the game where you can skip like the little uh, intro text or the, the intro cutscene at the very start of the level. Uh, the other level that you can do that in is uh, Jellyfish Fields. Then you want to run over here, interact with this door, skip the text box, and then this, this is basically when the level actually starts. So there's like a different, there's different routes that you can take because the objective here is that you need to get to these five hives that are scattered around the parlor and fill them all with mayo. So there is like different routes that you can take, but this is the route that I like to take in actual runs. So a thing here is that you kind of want to, you sometimes want to be facing backwards when you're stuffing a hive with mayo. And the reason for that is that, as you can see here, you can flash the suited prowler even while you're stuffing a mayo if you interact with the hive uh, facing backwards. So, as like a safety strat, you can just um, interact with every hive like facing backwards and that allows you to flash the suited prowler even while you're filling one of the hives. But you also can just flash him normally even when you're not stuffing a hive. But flashing him is the only way to deter him. So you just need to make sure that when he's getting close that you have a flash available. And he does like this little laughing sound like like right now that uh, indicates when he's getting close. So whenever you hear his laugh, that's when you want to make sure that you have that you have your flash ready so that when he shows up, you can flash him. Because the, the camera takes like about... It, it takes a little bit of time to refill again so that you can flash. So you like want to make sure that whenever the suited prowler is nearby, that the camera, the, the meter for the camera is, is full so that you can flash him when he shows up. And another thing is that when you stuff the hives with mayo, after a certain amount of time, more jellions will start to like appear. But in the speed run, you actually uh, beat the level so quickly that the other jellions can't really even spawn in. So that's, um, that is like one gimmick of the level, but since you're able to beat it so quickly, it doesn't even matter. Also, no, I didn't get a first corner spawning glove world. Uh, so here you just want to take this exact path. The the goal of this level is to activate these uh, three generators and then get back to the start. Um, but there are like some enemies that you have to worry about. So you have these guys which can't actually kill you but they just... Um, their main thing is that they shoot like this little spitball at you that can um, like block your vision a little bit. And then there's the alpha, which is the 
the big green dude that illuminates the entire area around them. And you basically don't want that guy to see you at all costs, basically. Because once he sees you, he shoots like a little spitball at you like with the other enemies that we saw earlier. But uh, that spitball actually stuns you in place for like two seconds. So nine times out of ten, if you get hit by that spitball, then the alpha is able to catch up to you and kill you. Unless you're like really far away. If you're like uh, a reasonable distance away from the alpha, then it won't actually... The, it w you can get stunned by a spitball and still be able to escape. So then here you just have like this little disco tile section. You just want to avoid the red disco tiles because the red disco tiles kill you. But the uh, blue and the yellow ones are fine. So there is like a strat here where you can actually jump over the red tiles. But I'm not gonna show that in this tutorial because uh, it's more of like a top level strat. Because it requires you to take advantage of that crouch jump tech that I mentioned earlier. Where you can crouch in the middle of a jump to be able to extend the jump, basically. And that extended jump allows you to jump over the red disco tiles. So then once you do that disco section, you just want to spam E on that generator and then start heading to the next area which is pretty much like right next door to where that generator is. You just follow like this little red wire on the ground and it takes you to the next generator. Then you have this little laser section. A thing to note is that if you die in the level prior to getting to this point, then the top set of layer lasers will actually be significantly lower because you can see there that they're so high up that they can't even like touch you but if you've died in the level before getting to that point then the, the lasers will actually be much lower so it makes that section a bit harder if you've died before getting to that point So then on the way to the third generator, you mainly just want to watch out for the Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy clones because if they see you, they'll shoot like a little uh, water ball at you, which is similar to all the, en the, all the other enemies that shoot like some kind of projectile at you and it stuns you for one second. But uh, even if you get hit by it, you still should have enough time to run away. But then you go into this room that has a bunch of these belchers. You just want to not stand under them or else they'll uh, like pick you up and you have to spam E to escape like this. And they can't actually kill you if you don't spam E quick enough, so you have to be careful about that. So after getting the third generator, now you just need to run back to the start, which is to the left of this area. And on the way back, you just kind of want to be looking at your surroundings to see if you see any of the enemies nearby. So there I saw the, uh, the Barnacle Boy clone, and we have the alpha over here is just kind of annoying. I think they both went that way, so that's fine actually. Yeah, if one of the enemies is in your way, you kind of just um, 
have to make sure that you like navigate around them. There are like these little help, uh, like little hiding spots that you can use if you know that one of them is nearby, and you can just hide in there and they won't be able to see you. But then yeah, you just get back to the start of the area, and then that basically starts the next section. But then this section is like another uh, boss fight like we saw earlier, but this time it's with Patrick. So uh, if you recall earlier, we actually skipped a combat tutorial in Patrick's Rock, which basically it shows like this type of gameplay style. But anyways, it gives you like a little refresher if you skipped it. But you want to have your cursor position on the top left of the screen after skipping that previous text box so that you can immediately close this menu. And then after that, you want to run to the middle of the arena so that the atomic flounder starts attacking you right away. And then here, uh, his attack patterns are always the same. So. Once you just like memorize his attack patterns, then uh, you can just like be able to beat him every time consistently. He always does a punch attack at the start, and then he does a punch attack and a clap attack. And then on the third phase, he does um, two clap attacks. So just like keep your distance until you know that he's about to become vulnerable and then just run up and punch him and then next to the sinister slug he kind of just like spins at you you need to make sure that you dodge his tail like while he he's spinning but it's pretty like self-explanatory you just kind of like run around the arena whenever he's spinning and then as soon as he stops spinning and you see the white exclamation mark symbol above his head. That's when you want to start punching him. It's actually important that you don't start punching him too early. Because if you punch him when he's like technically not vulnerable yet, then it doesn't actually count and you have to redo the current attack cycle. At the start of this fight, you want to immediately punch them so that it skips the dialogue of them talking. And then when he when the uh, when Jumbo Shrimp does like his charge attack, you want to wait for him to like stop right in front of you and then do a three hit combo. You don't want to hit him too early, or otherwise it's the same as before where. You have to redo the current attack phase. And then you just want to run away from that before it explodes. And then there's one last charge attack and then that's that entire fight. Then next is Prawn. For Prawn you just want to run around the arena and uh, wait for him to become vulnerable. It's probably like the most self-explanatory fight out of the six. You just wait for the disco tiles to uh, become white and then just run up and punch them and then just uh, repeat that three times. And each attack phase is like slightly longer than the previous one. It's kind of like the gimmick with most of the bosses here. So like for the for this last phase, you have to run around the arena for a bit longer than normal. And then that's the prawn fight. And then after that is Dirty Bubble. 
dirty bubble basically spawns in like these little mini bubbles and you just have to punch them before they hit you. And then after that he does like a little blow attack to try to blow you off the arena similar to Prawn. But you can kind of just run around the arena to avoid that attack. You just have to like make sure that you don't get like too close to him while he's doing his blow attack because then if you get too close then he'll actually be able to blow you off the arena. You kind of want to be standing in the spots that I stand for each phase so that you're kind of like near him when his blow attack ends but you're not like too close to the point where he can actually blow you off the arena. And then as soon as the white exclamation mark symbol appears above his head, you can immediately start heading towards him. And his uh, blow attack light won't actually blow you off. Like as soon as he, um, or as soon as the, the white exclamation symbol is above his head. So it's the same thing for this face, like you just want to wait until the white exclamation symbol is above his head and then you can immediately start heading towards him and punch him. So then after that is uh, Man Ray, he's the last boss out of this little uh, boss blitz that you have to do. So then at the start you want to jump over his little freeze ray attack. And then you kind of want to be like about half a disco tile in front of the center. And dodge like his projectiles. Then as soon as you try to punch him he does like this little counter attack where he like flies in the air. And then tries to punch you but you can block the punch. And then do the proper 3 hit combo on him. But the amount of time between the between you punching him and his counterattack decreases for each phase. And on the last phase he pretty much like counterattacks you the second that you punch him after uh, this little section where he tries to shoot at you. So you just have to be careful about that. As soon as you punch him here, you just want to instantly block and then do the 3 hit combo. And then that's it, that's the entire uh, boss rush section basically. But yeah, it's like, it's a bit to like digest I guess like all at once, but with a bit of practice like you can get all of those bosses down. And yeah, Mermelayer is kind of a beefy level in terms of length compared to the other levels. Like that level took like 16 minutes when uh, the other levels took way less time than that. Then after that you're able to pick between two levels again, but you definitely want to do industrial part first. Because um, there are a few things that can go wrong in industrial parts. So at the very start, you have these anglers that are patrolling the area. They can spawn at different points in this area. And your objective is basically get to get to the other side without them killing you, but Sometimes it can be a bit annoying. Okay, yeah. He turned around too early there, so... There was, like, nothing I could have done there. It can, like, kind of troll you sometimes, where, like... You, you have to, like, wait for them to get to a certain spot. 
or like sometimes they turn around earlier than they should and then you just die right on the spot there. This time the anglers weren't in the way at all so I was able to just run to the other side without them being there. You kind of just have to like adjust to where the anglers spawn like Sometimes they can be not in your way at all, and then other times you have both of the anglers that can spawn there, both be in the path that you need to go to. So then from here, once you get past that section with the anglers, you want to go to this section here with the trash cans and do a crouch jump to get onto it like I showed earlier. And that allows you to skip like this little section where you have to parkour on some barrels to get past some toxic waste. Then after you do that, you just want to interact with this door, press space during the load, skip the cutscene, and then this starts the next section of the level. So basically, for this section, you need to hit three of these like mayo towers that are scattered around the rooftops while this giant plankton clone is like circling around this area. So there is, this is like a bit cycle based because uh, the giant plankton always moves like in a circle at exactly the same rate every single time. And if you're too slow on one of the Mayo Towers then you have to wait for him to slowly circle around so that you can spray him with the Mayo. So I'm going to die on purpose here so I can show you like the cycle that you want to be on. So at the very start you purposely want to wait like a second or so for the screen to fade in before you start moving so that you're on the correct cycle. And then you want to um, interact with that first Mayo Tower once you're around there. You can kind of use like the shadow on the ground to um, like sort of indicate when you need to go. So then for this one you just want to wait until he's like around there is good. And then you can hit the second one. And then you have to wait for that um, little like laser ray thing to stop shooting or else it will actually kill you. And then for the last Mayo Tower you just want to run to it as soon as possible. And then as soon as the Plankton clone gets close you want to interact with it. So this is another section where you can uh, you can die and progress to the next section at the same time if the uh, if the uh, red menace actually like kills you after you hit the giant plankton the last time. So just like keep in mind that uh, as long as you hit giant plankton that last time, then you're automatically safe. Even if you die afterwards, it will still progress you to the next section. So then from here, you kind of just want to like camp in this corner here. Uh, and just keep firing at him until he starts throwing cars at you. Then after the second car, when he's like getting ready to throw the third one, that's when you want to like move to this side. And uh, one of the cars will hit you, but every other car will like land next to you like that. So that's kind of like a way to cheese the fight. And it's, uh, it's consistent too, like if you do that exact movement every single time then the cars will always land right next to you, but not actually hit you. And then uh, you can cheese the fight basically like that. Then you want to skip this text box and then that's it for Industrial Park. 
So then after that is Krusty Krab, and uh, Krusty Krab is basically like an auto-scroller. There are five different difficulty levels here, but the one that you want to pick is the one called 3 a.m. at the Krusty Krabs, and that's like the minimum completion requirement for the level is beating that difficulty. So this is basically like uh, a sit and survive kind of level where you just need to wait until 4 a.m. rolls by and then the level automatically ends. But you have to deal with the hash slinging slasher trying to get in. So uh, the hash slinging slasher has four different ways that you can get in. He can get in through the front door, the bathroom window, the back door, or the trap door in Mr. Krabs' office. And each uh, entry point that he tries to get into has a very distinct sound. So as soon as you hear the sound effect of him trying to get in, um, you immediately know which uh, side he's coming from. So that's like the sound effect for him trying to get in from the back door. It's kind of like a locker sound effect. That, that's the sound effect for him coming from the back. Then the trap door sound effect is kind of like your typical door knocking sound. Um, hopefully, you know, tries to, okay, there we go. Tries to like actually enter from other spots. So yeah, that's like your typical door knocking sound. If he enters from the front door, you kind of hear like a, a glass scraping sound like that. That's how you know he's coming from the front door, but if you're standing here, you can just see him coming from the front door anyways. And uh, the reason I stand in that exact spot after dealing with him is because you're pretty much like in the middle of all the spots that he can spawn. So you can like deal with him wherever he spawns. Mainly you want to be close to the bathroom in case he spawns in the bathroom window. Because you have to be fairly close to the bathroom to be able to deal with him if he spawns in there. Because it takes a bit of time to actually run to the bathroom window compared to the other spawns. Because for the other spawns, you pretty much have, like, plenty of time to be able to get to them from, like, any point in the map. But for the bathroom specifically, you have to be, like, close to the bathroom uh, to be able to deal with him if he comes through there. And, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that the, the sound effect for him coming from the bathroom window is, like, pretty much the sound of, like, tapping on a glass window. So it's uh, a pretty self-explanatory sound effect for him trying to get in from that route. So yeah, basically you're just listening to whatever direction he's coming from and then just running straight to that spot. And then uh, as the night progresses, there are like more audio disturbances in the background that try to like distract you. To like make the night a little bit harder and then at around at around 340 there's gonna be like green slime that spawns in and uh 
the green slime will create like a little puddle on the ground that will actually prevent you from sprinting while you're on top of it, so you just have to be careful about that. It only like slows you down a little bit, but sometimes it can actually make a difference. It's mainly like uh, on the harder difficulties where that like extra two seconds that it takes for you to get to the hatchling and slasher actually matters. So you saw there the, the green puddle was in front of the bathroom door. So it kind of took me a little bit longer to get there than normal. But it's not too bad. Like on the minimum difficulty for this level, you can pretty much be at like 99% consistently. The only way you would fail the level is if you're like talking and you're and you don't hear one of the sound cues for him getting in. So around like halfway into 350 you can actually just sit still and do nothing if you want to because it will actually roll in it will roll over to 4 a.m before the hashling slasher can even kill you and you can skip this cutscene by the way i forgot about that and then after skipping that cutscene you want to skip this text box and then that's the entire level basically so the entire level is basically like a sit and survive type of gameplay. So then next up is Larry's Gym. This is pretty much what I would consider like the last mid-game segment of the run. I would consider all of the daytime levels to be um, late game segments. Then here you want to run over here. I sort of like try not to move my mouse on the way over here because that actually keeps your cursor in the same spot as when you skip the, the previous text box so you don't need to like worry about moving your cursor again to skip another text box. Then you want to interact with this door and wait here for Larry to come out and then after he comes out you want to spam E to get into this vent. So then after uh, you knock on Larry's office, he's basically going to go to like different rooms to investigate. And uh, he has like a very simple AI, like if he sees you, he starts running at you. If you get out of his line of sight for like two seconds, then he de -aggros. So he has like a really simple AI system. The main thing is that when he's running at you, he basically moves like the same speed as you. So you just have to be uh, careful about that. If he's chasing you into the vent and you're like far enough ahead of him, you can actually like barely squeeze into the vent before he can kill you. But yeah, you kind of just want to occasionally be monitoring like where he is and that was also a strat that I just casually did there where uh, if you crouch while you're falling down that vent opening you can kind of like land on the locker there and that skips a a little bit of movement like having to go around the locker So when you open that door, you just want to be like really careful that Larry is not just waiting on the other side because that can happen sometimes. So usually when I open that door, I wait for like a few seconds to kind of see where 
Larry is or like where he's heading. And then you just want to go here, do these weights. Now you want to make sure that um, you don't land like too far into that first anchor weight because it will actually like soft lock you. I see you. Uh, because you leave like the interaction radius for it like before you actually finish spamming E on it. So it will soft lock you, so you just want to be careful of that. So that was like a pretty uh, clean Larry's gym, like Larry pretty much didn't see me the entire level until the very end, which is a scripted chase sequence getting back to the entrance. And yeah, that's the entire level. So. Mainly, like, uh, each time you go through Larry's gym is kind of, like, different, like, sometimes you can run through the entire level without seeing Larry, like, a single time, or other times he's, like, constantly harassing you. You want to press space here to immediately skip a cutscene is kind of, uh, what I mentioned earlier where this is the second level in the entire game where you can skip the the intro text at the very beginning of the level. <laughs> in every other level you have to actually like sit and watch it. So then for jellyfish fields you kind of just want to like go around these pinkies and then here once you get to this point the the uh, Prince Jellion will try to like charge up an attack and and try to hit you with it. And if he hits you with that electricity beam, it actually kills you. So I died on purpose there just to kind of go like uh, another way that you can do that section. So if one of the pinkies is in your way, you can actually take like a slightly different route there. Where you kind of get sapped on purpose. Okay, I kind of messed it up there, but you can uh, jump through a pinky zap basically, and that allows you to cover a little bit of ground uh, while getting zapped. Which actually does make a difference there because you can only you can only uh, barely make that cycle if you jump through the pinky zap like that. Okay, I keep messing this up, but like basically you can land on that little ledge like next to the tree. And the uh, the Prince Jellion actually, uh, like his little uh, electricity zap can't actually hit you if you're on that ledge. So if one of the pinkies is in your way and you're forced to get zapped by it, you can like jump over here and you can see that the his little bolt of electricity didn't actually hit you. And then you can run along like the side of that bridge there because for some reason the hitbox for it like extends past the actual railing a bit. So you can kind of just run along the side of the bridge there. And it's a little bit more optimal than going like the regular route. So then, the rest of this level is basically just reacting to where all of the Jellions are positioned. Because they do wander around randomly. So you saw there was a Prowler there. That Prowler does tend to wander all over the place a lot. It can actually wander like pretty far away from its initial starting point, so... You kind of just need to be wary of that. But yeah, like I mentioned earlier, this entire section of the level is pretty much just reacting to where all of the Jellions wander off to. There was a split path earlier, uh, but I always take the bottom path because the bottom path is significantly easier than the top path. Uh, I could like maybe show the top path just to 
like show what it looks like, but you pretty much always want to take the bottom path. Because taking the top path is a lot riskier and taking the bottom path is quicker if you crouch jump up these rocks. Because jumping up them normally is kind of slow, like if you just jump on one at a time like this. But you can crouch jump and be able to skip one of the jumps each time. So that's like a bit efficient. So once you get up here, you need to get all the way over there. And you just need to be wary of this uh, Prowler. This Prowler does like to hide in the kelp in this section. You shouldn't have to really worry about any of the other Jellians that are up here besides that Prowler. Because most of the other Jellians spawn like on the other side of the map. Which is uh, like where you go if you take the top path. So you just want to skip like these two text boxes and then we go into like another boss fight with Patrick. We kind of like that uh, like boxing style gameplay that we saw before. Then you can, um, at the very start of the fight, you can just jump onto this boulder. And then that basically like kind of cheeses the fight. Because you can just camp up here and then wait for the boss to charge at you. And then similar to Jumbo Shrimp, once the boss charges and like gets right in front of you, that's when it becomes vulnerable. But if you're like too close to the boss when it starts charging at you like this, then it will be like trying to get to you, but you're already like inside of its hitbox. So when that happens, you just want to back up a little bit and then go back into its hitbox so that you're not just like in that permanent state of like it trying to get to you, but you're already inside of its hitbox. And then on the last hit, if it's really far away from the rock like that, you actually just want to run towards it. Because on the last hit, it's just faster to run towards the boss. If it's like really far away from the little cheese spot that you're in. But yeah, um, that cheese spot basically makes the fight free. Skip a text box here, and then that's the entire level. And then next is Gulagoon. This level is like pretty much infamous for like being able to skip like 80% of the level using a bunch of strats in conjunction. Pretty much like is the most uh, exploitable level in the entire game by a long shot. So at the very start here, you want to run to these specific points to trigger all of these text boxes, since you actually need to trigger all of these text boxes for Mr. Krabs to spawn all the way back there to be able to progress. Because uh, Mr. Krabs basically tells you to run off to the sand castle that's over here to go get a screwdriver so that we can open those vents. So I did do a strat earlier there where I kind of cut through these little bamboo poles. And uh, normally when you go past like this little line created by the bamboo poles, there's actually like some nestlers that are chilling out in the sand like you can kind of see that one pretty clearly and they actually like aggro on you if you go too far away from the main path it's sort of like an out of bounds detection kind of thing
And once the Nestlers aggro on you, they never de-aggro, so even if you go back inbounds, they'll still kill you. But you can kind of go out of the uh, the bamboo hole. Like you can kind of go past them and still not aggro any of the Nestlers, so you can kind of take like a little bit of a shortcut on the way to the sandcastle and on the way back, but it only saves like 5 seconds or something, or maybe even less than that. So it saves like a very tiny amount of time. But then once you lure this pinky to this generator, when it zaps you, you can actually like jump forward a little bit. And uh, you can actually, like I kind of showed before, you can like, uh, you can kind of like tank through a pinky zap and just like continue moving forward even while you're stunned because of the momentum that you got from jumping. Uh, so then once you get here, you just want to do like two quick uh, crouches to get onto here. It can sometimes be a little bit tricky to get up here. There's like a little invisible wall here, but once you get up, you kind of want to go over here, then jump onto this rock, and then you can kind of jump on this entire back section of this statue. And then by doing that, you basically climb onto the same castle walls. And then from here, you can basically, like, parkour your way all the way to where the screwdriver is, which is, like, the main objective of this section. So the route that I took to get here is pretty much the exact route that you want to take. Uh, I'm just heading back to, like, uh, demonstrate it again. Because basically, if you take this route, even if you fall like that at any point, you don't like soft lock yourself because you always fall into a room that you've already been to. Because normally, if you go like the other way, there's a chance that uh, you fall into a room where you get soft locked because normally you have to like press a button to open one of these gates to progress. And uh, if the gate is not already open when you fall into that room, then you get soft luck. But if you take this exact route, even if you fall at any point doing these jumps, you'll always fall into a room that you've been to already, so you won't soft luck. Then once you get here, you want to jump here, and then you want to fall into this room because this is where the screwdriver is. And uh, doing those jumps consistently does require a bit of practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. It's pretty lenient, or it's like fairly lenient to do those jumps. So on the way back, you can kind of do what I described before and kind of like cut through the little bamboo poles. Uh, normally that would aggro a nestler that is like over there somewhere, but if you stay like close enough to the path without straying too far, then that nestler won't aggro and you're able to kind of take a little shortcut on the way there and on the way back. So here, um, the weenie bot here, he can spawn in three different places, or he can spawn going to three different places. So he can either do his little scan like right here, like what just happened, or he can go all the way to the front over there, or he can go to that room. So basically what you want to do is, um, Depending on wherever spot he spawns in, um, you want to jump onto like a nearby table and then kind of lure him to a wall 
And then if you do that, you're able to basically get him stuck. So you spawn in the same spot again. So if you jump on a table and then like lure him to a wall, he's kind of just stuck like facing the wall and now you can uh, go and like grab the mayo that you need from here uh, without having to worry about him chasing you. But I'm gonna die on purpose a few times to try to see if I can get the different places that he can go to at the very start. So this time he went like more this way before doing his scan, but it's kind of the same thing. You you just uh, stand close enough so that he sees you, then you jump onto this table and then do the same thing. And then there's uh, there's another spot that he can go to at the very start where he goes to the very back of the room uh, he didn't spawn there but basically if he does spawn there he kind of goes like back there and does his scan and then you can just jump on this set of tables and get him stuck here instead he does lose a little bit of time as opposed to him spawning in the other two spots, but um, it pretty much is the same method of like getting him stuck. So then you just have to navigate to these rooms and pick up the mayo from these two like little sides of the restaurant. Then once you get the two mayo, then uh, you can just leave from the same way that you entered. Then you want to enter here and then just... Um, so there's another strat that you can do here to skip a decent amount of this section. Basically what you do is you jump onto this chair at the very start and then you uh, You turn around and face directly up And then if you notice that when you jump it says that you can like interact with something When you're at the peak of your jump so you jump interact with the thing and then uh, Suddenly you get like teleported up here. So you actually skip like a decent section of this level of like having to go all the way around to get to this point. And then after you grab the the shades there, you want to uh, crouch jump onto this chair and then crouch jump onto or jump to the lower floor. You don't have to crouch jump, you can just do a regular jump. Then you enter here, interact with that little like pot there, and then just run this way and then that triggers like the next section of the level. You want to press space there to skip a cutscene, and then you want to run this way as soon as the next area loads. So there's another strat here where you crouch jump onto this chair, and then jump onto this railing, and then that basically lets you run along the railing to get to where you need to go, but I will die on purpose just to demonstrate it again. And also, yeah, jumping onto that railing does, um, that does break Dennis's AI, but that doesn't really matter too much. Since you can kind of just run to the end without even seeing him at all, besides like at the very start. So you crouch jump on here, crouch, or you jump onto the railing, you don't need to crouch jump again. You kind of hug the railing and then you fall down like here. But you have to be careful because there's like two invisible walls here. You need to make sure you land perfectly in between the two invisible walls. But then if you do that, you just spam E to uh, get past like that barricade and then just uh, leave through the front door. 
We skip this cutscene and that's the entire level. So then, uh, after that is Sandy's Treatum. This is pretty much like the last main level in the game. Because after that is basically the, the final boss. So a lot of people say that this is like the hardest level in the game, but once you actually like know what you're doing, it becomes like a very consistent level that you can just beat like 90% of the time or something like that without dying. Okay. So in the speed run, this level is uh, more of a pushover than anything. You just want to run over here. The main thing that is kind of dumb about this level is that it's really hard to see when you're outside of the treehouse. Okay. So if you don't know exactly where to go, it can be kind of annoying to have to find all the pieces to build a flamethrower to get out and then like do all of that while um, Nut Alarm is chasing after you because he's basically the main enemy of this level, but he's the only enemy in this level, basically. So in this area, you can't sprint when you go past this yellow line on the floor, because then that will wake up Sandy. So you just need to make sure that once you go past that yellow line that you just don't sprint. But if you're like behind the yellow line, then you're able to sprint. So from this point, we need to run around the area and pick up these various pieces and then bring them back to that little like workbench in the treehouse. So in the speed run, we always pick up the one that is over here, like next to this uh, picnic table. I basically just call it the picnic table piece even though the actual thing is like a roll of duct tape or something. You always get that one first because after you get the first piece outside that's when Nut Alarm becomes active and then once Nut Alarm is active you have to kind of like chook around him to be able to dodge him. So then after that uh, we pick up the next piece that's over here. And then since Nut Alarm is active now, we kind of have to like do this little juke. So you see he's like up there. But since we're down here, he's like not able to get to us until like we're already in the door. So that's like the first uh, method of juking him basically. And after that, he can also like spawn while you're inside the tree dome. So depending on where he comes in from, you have to kind of like react accordingly. Then after that, you want to run this way, get this piece, and then you, you kind of chook Nut Alarm like in the same way that we did before. We're like, he's above us and we're below him, so we're able to just like pass on by pretty much like being right next to him without him actually killing us. So um, you just have to be wary that when you're outside of the tree house, the uh, nut alarms like radius for activating or for, for like his kill radius is a lot bigger when you're outside the treehouse as opposed to when you're inside. So here you purposely want to wait for like a second there because otherwise if you don't wait there then Nut Alarm will actually do a 180 and cut you off. Because Nut Alarm always takes the shortest path to you. 
So if the shortest path to you is behind him, then he'll just immediately do a 180 to try to cut you off. So then after the force of the fourth piece, there's kind of like a barricade that's blocking the door. So you need to kind of juke him inside of the treehouse as well. So in that room, you can like juke him around the table or you can juke him around the couch that is like on the back side. And then after you get the sixth piece, then the other door in the other room gets barricaded. So you have to juke him like on the way in and on the way out. Basically, every single time you go to the treehouse after that point. So here you want to take this specific route. to like barely avoid nut alarms like kill radius. Then, uh, because of the barricade being there, you have to walk, like, a little bit farther to get to the fireplace, and you also have to, like, shoot him on the way out of this room. So then, after the sixth piece is, uh, like, put on the workbench, then the other door will get, uh, barricaded, so now we have to juke him in this room as well. So then the way I juke him here is juking him like around this little counter here. So you kind of like wait for him to get close. Then you can kind of juke him like that. And then for the next piece we're gonna go over here and then we have to wait for Nut Alarm to like pop out of the doorway like way in the distance so you can kind of see like his silhouette in the distance like way back there and then that's when you see that that's when you want to proceed and pick up the piece and then kind of like juke him in the fashion that I'm showing here. So when you're just like chuking him and inside the treehouse, you just want to make sure that you're not um, you're not like trying to juke him too quickly because you have to remember that uh, since he takes the shortest path to you, if you try to juke him too quickly, then he'll actually do a 180 to try to cut you off, like I mentioned before. So you just kind of want to like take your time when you're juking him and not try to juke him like too quickly because otherwise he'll turn around and try to cut you off. So then you want to grab this piece and then you can kind of like climb over this wall here. There's like a little section of that wall that you can just climb over. And then we pretty much do the same route as like the previous piece from there. So Nut Alarm can also spawn from that window over there. He actually didn't spawn from the window that entire time. He, like all of these times, he's either spawned from the bathroom or from the entrance to the treehouse. But he can also spawn from the window as well. Then after that, once you get the last piece, all you have to do is just run to the door of the treehouse without a um, nut alarm activating, but that's pretty much like, you pretty much have finished the level once you 
put the last piece on the workbench. Because from there all you have to do is just run to the entrance, which is like right here. Just avoid that pile of sticks on the floor. Because uh, it actually does matter if you step on those. And then uh, you press space to skip a cutscene, and then that's the entire level. So then at this point, we get to the final boss, basically, which is the, the name of the level is just a triple question mark. But uh, the actual final boss is called the Overlord. So this final level is pretty much split into like four sections. So with this first section, you're basically doing this little like shooting segment where you have to shoot all of the jellians with like the mayo that you've accumulated throughout the game. So like using all of the mayo that we've accumulated throughout the game, we're actually able to like fight back now. So then every time the Overlord appears at the front doorway, you want to start like shooting at him once his like little animation for appearing ends. You can't shoot him like right away, you have to like sort of wait for his animation to end before he's actually vulnerable. And then you just want to manage your, uh, you want to manage the little meter on the right, because if the meter fills up all the way, then your mayo cannon will overheat and it has to take like a few seconds to cool off again, so you can't fire any shots if it overheats for like a few seconds. So it's pretty much just managing the meter to make sure that it doesn't fill up all the way. While also dealing with all of the jellians that show up. They do have the prowlers as well, which are like really hard to see because of how bright it is in this area. Um, but these waves are like always consistent, so if you know like when a prowler is gonna spawn then you're able to like deal with it every single time. The only time there's actual variability in the, the enemies that you encounter is uh, during the last wave. Because during the last wave, uh, the enemies will drop down randomly. As opposed to coming in set waves every single time. So yeah, mainly you just have to be wary of the prowlers because they're like really hard to see sometimes. You pretty much only their teeth is visible, like the rest of their body is like completely invisible. So then for the last wave, instead of having to kill like a set amount of jellians, you have to focus all of your shots on this uh, alpha basically, while also dealing with other jellians that randomly spawn in. So this is pretty much like the only uh, element of randomness in this section. And then after you get rid of the alpha, you can just focus all of your shots on the overlord 
since uh, all of the other enemies immediately disappear as soon as you deal with the Overlord. So then that's pretty much uh, the first section of this final level done. You just skip this text box and then the next section starts. So now we're, this is the uh, rock bottom section where um, you basically need to get to the museum on the other side. But there's going to be some enemies that you need to deal with. Now one of the two enemies that you need to deal with, you can actually just kind of like run past them without even having to really deal with them. And then the other one, you just have to flash whenever you hear the sound of like rumbling, either coming from the left or to the right. So this is like another section that is kind of encouraged to uh, use headphones so you can tell which direction the sound is coming from. Sometimes you can actually just see him there, like, uh, because of the lantern that the other characters are carrying. You can sometimes just see him, like, right next to you without even having to listen for the sound. But yeah, you kind of want to stay, like, slightly off the road here, and staying slightly off the road prevents the other enemy from killing you in this section. And you basically like run past him uh, before he can even kill you. So, you. so you only have to deal with the Alaskan Bullworm during that section and uh, you just deal with him by flashing him so it's pretty like self-explanatory. The, the main thing is just making sure that you stay slightly off the the main path so that you don't run into the other enemy like while going through So now this is the third section of the final level where we basically have one last like mini boss fight with Doodle Patrick. So here like his first two attack phases are exactly the same every single time but every attack phase afterwards you can actually manipulate it by punching him while he's not vulnerable. And every time he does like that little side swipe attack is when he becomes vulnerable. So here like if he does like a projectile attack you can punch him to like reset his attack cycle basically. So you can try to get him to do like a different attack. You you kind of want to punch him like anytime he does his uh projectile attack or his cartwheel attack because those attacks take a while to actually finish compared to like his other attacks. So I'm actually getting like pretty lucky here with having him do a bunch of side swipe attacks in a row. That time he did do a projectile attack, but yeah. Sometimes you can get lucky like that and just have him do a bunch of side swipes in a row and you can just land a bunch of hits on him in quick succession. But yeah, if he does like his cartwheel attack, you just want to punch him so that it resets his attack cycle and you can try to get him to do a different attack because if you try to wait out the car wheel attack normally, it takes like forever. That attack uh, lasts the longest out of all the attacks he can do. So 
so then this is the final section. You want to skip that text box and then move your cursor like to the top left of the screen. So then you can immediately skip this uh, prompt. So yeah, this is the actual like final boss now. So at the very start, you want to jump over that little um, shock wave attack that he does. You're able to double jump in this section, so you can jump a lot higher than normal. And then you're basically waiting for that little meter on the side to fill up, and then once it fills up, you can fire a guitar shot at the boss. And you need to do that nine times uh, in order to finish the run, basically. So the first couple of attacks he does is just really self-explanatory, he just like runs circles around the arena and his attacks won't hit you. His attacks become a bit more complex um, once we get to the second phase, which happens after you hit him three times. And then the third phase happens after you hit him six times. So then uh, during that phase he does like a couple of the shock waves in a row. But they're like pretty easy to dodge. And then he goes back to fitting goo balls at you. So now is when his attacks switch up a bit, and now he's gonna try to send his tentacles like under the arena to try to hit you from underneath. But if you constantly stay in the air, his uh, tentacles that try to hit you from underneath won't be able to actually target you. So you can see those little like circles on the ground, those are like where his tentacles are trying to hit you from below, but if you constantly jump in the air then they won't even target you. So now during this phase, um, he's gonna try to spin his tentacles like in a rotation and you just have to jump over them. And you kind of want to avoid like those two sections of the arena because that's where his Tentacles always drop down. I had to get hit there, but that's fine. In pretty much all of the bosses, you have uh, three hits that you can take, so if you get hit, it doesn't really matter too much. So then now he's gonna like go airborne, and basically you want to avoid the side that has like the green monitors because that's always the the side that he goes to once he starts this attack cycle. And he does this attack cycle three times. So once you hit him, you want to check like which side of the arena you are and try to avoid the, the green side until he starts uh, moving again. So now he's gonna like shoot pinkies at you, but you can pretty much dodge the pinkies in the same way you dodge the little spitballs that he shoots at you, so it doesn't really add any challenge to this part. And then uh, once your guitar get, once the meter gets kind of full, you want to try to get close to him so you can get a good shot on him. You want to try to make sure that you don't miss any shots because if you miss a shot then you have to wait a long time for the meter to fill up again. So you just really you mainly just want to make sure that you don't miss any of your guitar shots. 
then he's gonna do this attack cycle again where he spins his tentacles in a circle and then after that the fight is over basically and then timing ends right when you hit him the last time Yeah, that's the entire run, basically. So yeah, that was uh, pretty much my uh, life tutorial for this category. There are other categories that are a bit shorter if you just want to like get a feel for the game without having to fully commit to it by doing like a two hour run or something. Like there are categories that are much shorter like uh, Spongebob RTA or Square Percent where they're just uh, significantly shorter than any percent. If you kind of just want to, um, like, get a feel for the run without having to fully commit to doing, like, a two-hour run. The time that you would kind of want to aim for, like, when you're first starting off is getting a sub-two-hour time. Uh, since, uh, uh, getting a sub two hour time is, like, fairly easy to do, like, you can, you can die, like, five times throughout the run and still be able to get a sub two. So that's kind of, like, the time that you want to go for when you're first starting off. But, like, a really good time currently would be a, a sub-140. That would be, like, a really good time in, like, the current standards. But yeah, like, when you're just starting off getting, like, trying to get, like, a, a sub-two-hour run is uh, good enough. You know, you can... Like I mentioned before, you can kind of die like five times throughout the run and still be able to get a sub two time because it gives you like enough leniency. And then, yeah, um, I'm hoping that this tutorial is able to get more runners into the game and stuff. Oh. I know like we've kind of been long due for some kind of an any percent tutorial because the game has been around for like a year and uh, a tutorial didn't even exist until now. But yeah, I think uh, I'm pretty satisfied with how this tutorial went. So. I will be um, uploading it to YouTube after the fact, you know, so um, anyone who like wasn't able to see the entire tutorial can uh, see it like when I upload it or you, I think I'll also make like a Twitch highlight of it as well. So you can see it or so that it's uh, permanently preserved on Twitch as well. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, that tutorial went pretty well, so, yeah, that's gonna be, um, that's pretty much gonna be it for me, this stream. I kind of just wanted to dedicate the entire stream to doing the tutorial. Oh yeah, uh, one thing that I want to do actually before I go off is um, I want to show how you can actually 
like submit a run of the game. I figure uh, some people would maybe be curious how you can actually submit a run after you do one. So I'm gonna switch the the scene here in a second to show my uh actual like desktop so then here um this is basically like the home screen for speedrun.com so then once you get here you just want to type um around the clock at bikini bottom you don't even have to type the full thing you can just type like around and it should be the first thing that shows up and then for whatever category you did a run of, like if you did a Mr. Krabs RTA or something, you just um, you go to the category that you did a run of, you hit the submit run button, and then it will take you to like this page where you basically put your name here, um, you put the time that you got. You don't need to include milliseconds. You only include milliseconds for um, individual level times because milliseconds aren't really needed for runs that are like over uh, 30 minutes in length or something. So for the sake of consistency, um, we just made it so only um ILs have uh or only ILs use milliseconds everything else doesn't use milliseconds so you wouldn't include the milliseconds in your submission unless it actually is an IL and then here if it's a category that has a subcategory you would put the subcategory so in this case if you did a Mr. Krabs RTA run you would change it to Mr. Krabs then you put the video link here. So normally you put a uh, like a YouTube video or a Twitch VOD, or I mean a, a Twitch highlight. If if you submit it uh, from Twitch, you want to make sure that it's a Twitch highlight because if it's a regular VOD, then the VOD will get uh, deleted after two weeks automatically unless you archive it as like a highlight or something so yeah ideally you want to submit runs as um either a youtube video or a witch highlight and then uh you can put your splits in here but that's optional like using splits.io and you can put a description, which is also optional. And then this automatically verify run section is in here, like if you're not a moderator, but it is for me. And then you would just hit submit. And then uh, like at some point, uh, one of the mods would verify the run. And then yeah, it would pop up on the actual leaderboard so yeah i think i i pretty much covered everything like the actual run itself and also like uh submitting to the leaderboard and everything or submitting to the leaderboard and everything like that so um yeah i'm gonna go off for now um you can follow me on twitter you know, like the next time that I go live, the next stream should just be um, regular any percent attempts with uh, the new input display that I downloaded. Because I initially just downloaded this input display for um, for the tutorial, but I figure I might as well just keep it there because I figure it would be helpful to know during runs as well, like what inputs I'm doing and stuff. So yeah, um, thanks everyone for stopping by and I'm gonna head out for now. See ya.